I am Paul Sisnet. I am CEO of the Dutch company Pay with Glass. We are a digital currency infrastructure designer, and um, we're, our technology is being used to power the UK's first digital sterling uh, pilot. So it's a private sector-led CBDC pilot for the UK. Uh, in terms of how I got into crypto, it's a long story. <laughs> I'll give the condensed version. Uh, I started in 2011. Um, where I was looking for a solution or a technology solution that could allow me to move my own funds a lot more easily, a lot more quickly, because uh, my background is in the telecommunications industry. A lot of my contracts were for clients in various countries, so I would relocate quite frequently. And there is the nightmare of getting access to your own money every time you go to a new country. Crypto, the blockchain technology behind crypto seemed like uh, the way to solve that problem. And at that point, I knew nothing about the banking industry and realized that what I was trying to solve was a much bigger challenge. So that's where the story started. Fair enough. I've already introduced myself. So I'll just say hello again. Uh, Dr. Jacin Cherry Herrera from Michael Cipriano Group. I won't give the introduction again. And I'm hoping it's the same audience uh, from before. Hi, my name is Philip Vasquez. I'm the one who's missing from the screen uh, with Damex.io, and I'm the head of legal. Got involved in crypto about five to six years ago, uh, purely because I was really enjoying the, the boom in the, the idea of self-sovereignty, financial sovereignty. Um, and Damex, as you might know already, is a you know, leading uh, OTC desk and uh, crypto payments platform with a retail uh, application coming out soon. If you're into self-sovereignty, I can't wait to hear some contrarian thoughts on CBDCs, but we'll see. Go. Hi, everyone. My name is Mikko Ohtama. I'm the CEO of TradingStrategy.ai. That's a non-custodial DeFi protocol for uh, algorithm trading. And I started with Bitcoin in 2013. I was uh, building one of the first Bitcoin exchanges in the world. Fantastic. OK, so explain it to me like I'm five years old. What the heck is a central bank digital currency? So uh, the simple answer is this. It's a digital form of cash. So cash is just one part of the economy that we use. Uh, in the UK, it's about 3% of the, of the pounds in circulation. The CBDC is effectively a digital version of that. It's not magic. It's not the devil. It's not some sort of weird thing that the central banks have come up with because of crypto. It is literally a way for cash to work in the digital world. OK. How is that different from a bank electronically moving money around? Ah, well, effectively, electronic money in the bank is commercial bank money. Effectively, it's not money that comes from the central bank. It's not a liability on the central bank. It's a liability on the bank that produces it. So for a lack of a better way of putting it, banks effectively print money out of thin air, and most of the money in circulation is that money. But uh, there are regulations around this. They have to make sure that that money they're printing uh, you know, is backed by assets of some type or of a certain volume or value or whatever the case would be, in some cases, including commercial, sorry, uh, central bank money. But uh, commercial bank money and, and, and CBDCs are not the same thing, even though they're designated in the same currency. So the Bitcoin white, I'll stick with you for a second. So the Bitcoin white paper says a proposal for peer to peer a proposal for, for a peer-to-peer -peer digital cash system. Well, electronic payment system. But uh, yeah, so it is, it's not the first attempt to make a digital cash system. If you go back to the 80s, you had DigiCash, uh, David Shom's uh, attempt at the time. It is the first solution, or Bitcoin, I would say, is the first attempt that actually worked in the way it was intended to. But it doesn't scale. And that's one of the challenges of blockchain itself. So CBDCs are a result of that evolution, I would say because the entire world has moved at a rather accelerated pace in the last decade. Mm -hmm. And uh, there is a need for regular money or regular liabilities, I would say, on the central bank to move into that world. You don't have a space for physical cash in a digital currency economy, mm -hmm. but you need it. So this is CBDCs. That's the answer. It's digital M0. All right, so continue my five-year-old education. Can you add to that concept? Um, uh, no, I mean, Continuing following from that, I would say when it comes to CBDCs, we're seeing lots of different designs and architecture emerge. So it could be you have a direct claim against a central bank. It could be you have a direct claim against the commercial banks acting as an intermediary. Um, in terms of design elements, we're seeing account-based and token-based. So uh, banks and central banks are finally realizing that people want privacy. So they're trying to put certain design elements into the design of CBDCs 
to account for privacy. So that's when it comes to token base. There might be certain caps on uh, certain payments you can make which won't uh, need you to verify your identity. Then you have account based which will need you to uh, verify your um, identity. Um, so we're seeing lots of different designs emerging depending on if you're speaking about Europe, about US. Um, we've seen some have launched already. So in China, it's the E1 which has been uh, launched a while ago. I think there's about 3.5 million active wallets. Um, uh, there's a few other um, places like Jamaica and Bahamas, I, I think, if I'm not mistaken, which have launched a, a CBDC. Uh, we're seeing a lot of exploration and collaboration as well in the space. So there's something called the Asian Network, uh, which is central banks such as um, Singapore, Cambodia, Thailand, uh, which are leveraging and partnering with R3. Um, which basically launched a sandbox which allow all these central bank players to um, uh, basically play in the sandbox and see how they can come up with certain uh, features and solutions um, uh, and see how they can be integrated into this new design and architecture when shifting to CBDCs. Uh, this is because interoperability also has a, has a clear role to play. Um, so we're seeing various sort of uh, designs um, um, launch depending on where you are. Um, somewhere like the US hasn't launched yet and they're still sort of exploring the route they want to take. Like there's um, a committee called uh, Project Lithium, I, I, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, which are um, taking all this into consideration and seeing which, which routes they want to take. Um, we're seeing the UK, which is actually quite interesting in terms of their take, which you could probably expand on further um, in terms of uh, how they're approaching stable coins regulation. Uh, so they're basically stating that when it comes to stable coins, um, they will take stable coins under the protection of the central bank. So they will afford stable coins the same protections that um, uh, they afford to banks. Um, and this is because uh, when it comes to banks, deposit insurance is like the opium of banks. So why does anyone deposit money with central, with banks? Deposit insurance is the opium of banks? So this is a, this is a quote from oh, Karl oh. Marx. So deposit insurance is the opium for commercial banks, basically because of certain protections that they are afforded, including bailouts and, and, and everything else. This is why they are trusted, because they are basically controlled by central banks and they are afforded certain protections um, in various regulations, which are Bible-like, like Basel III and so on and so forth. Okay, so Philip, g give us your spin on We'll get into the pros and cons, but the definition of central bank digital currency, yeah. w w is there anything been missed? For sure. I mean, I'm not going to, to add to Paul and Justine's uh, you know, great introduction. I think what I would say is, um, in my view, there's also the perspective that CBDCs are the 3.0 of stable coins. It's kind of the growth trajectory. Oh, sorry, are, are the what? 3.0. I okay. mean, there is that view to take as well. I'm not saying that they're on the same track, but... It's definitely, it might follow a similar trajectory. You know, I mean, uh, my colleague uh, Jeremy King later on uh, this evening at, a, an, at another event that we're hosting uh, will explain, you know, um, how stable coins account for 80% of the daily volume, but only 16% of the total market cap. Mm -hmm. CBDCs, if we're going to bring those into the mix, depending on how permissioned they are, are going to be um, potentially that form of liquidity on steroids because we're not just talking about the, the capital markets within the crypto sphere, but we're talking about that level of liquidity on fiat mm. at scale on the blockchain. So, you know, we're going to see more liquid events and a potential competition between stable coins, CBDCs, and in my perspective, which I'll go into later, these hybrids where nation states can issue their own central currencies one for one against you know, a, a more dominant fiat. So for example, Gibraltar has its own Gibraltar pound. Mm. In an ideal world, I'd like to see you know, nations, sovereign states try and issue uh, I, a I pound, it. which is yeah. one for one the same as the UK sterling. So I, in summary, I see CBDCs as a potential uh, grown up version of, of the stable coins that we have. But they obviously have the pros and the cons, and we'll leave that for the there, next. There's, there's whole sections of French Africa that could maybe benefit from that as opposed to like having the CFA. So there's interesting. Okay, longer conversation, Miko. Okay, thank you for all the good explanations. So if I can summarize here. Uh, so now you have a cash in your hand. You have a money in a bank. That's not your money, but it's bank's money. 
and with the central bank digital currencies, you no longer have banks anymore. So you have uh, your money in the central bank and your money uh, belongs to government, not to you anymore. Okay, well fine. The using Pro, CBDC, I intuited, but I don't know yet, that you may have some issues with it if you're talking about self-sovereignty. You seem pro, and I guess we'll figure it out. I wouldn't say pro. I'd say first they should fix the problem with the traditional financial well, hold on, markets. Hold on, hold on, hold on. I'm going to do this in nice uh, order. Okay, my friend. So, well, well, sorry, uh, why should I welcome our new CBDC overlords? <laughs> Uh, well, first of all, I think there's a bit of a misunderstanding in terms of what a CBDC is. And if you have to look at the design first to sort of determine if the position is going to be, as, as, as Miko put it, uh, it is the, the central bank's money versus commercial money, which is the bank's money. Mm -hmm. uh, if you design the infrastructure upon which CBDCs or through which CBDCs are issued and through which they're put into circulation and made available to the masses, then there is a possibility, and we've done that within Project New Era, to create a solution that supports self-sovereignty of identity, which I'll get to in a moment, as well as self-custody of the assets. So once the money has been issued to you or has reached your wallet, it is yours. It's not the government's money from that standpoint. The government has the authority to issue it. They have the authority to say, okay, this money is good. We back it. This money has, uh, you know, it, it can be recognized and accepted in other parts of the world or whatever the case may be. I'm going to interrupt you. I'm going to ask a question and then I'll let you continue. Yeah. W what's stopping the government from acting as circle with USDC, identifying, yes, it's your US dollar coin, okay, but what's stopping them from going, but we're freezing that because of XYZ? Well, uh, civil war. <laughs> huh? Civil war. Riots in the streets. At the end of the day, if the government issues money to, uh, you know, in digital form and you have access to that money and at some point they decide without just cause, in other words, you haven't committed a crime that's clearly a crime, you haven't been involved in money laundering where you're using that money and they decide just because you've voted for their own political party to freeze that money, that's the beginning of civil war because your, your civil liberties, your freedoms are being encroached upon by the government or by individuals within the government without just cause. That's not their place. And that's why a design that takes, uh, that supports uh, self-custody is very important mm -hmm. because that shouldn't even be a question, to be quite honest. We have the technology. We've been developing, uh, you know, the digital currency space for a very long time. We have, it has matured substantially. Stable coins are here. They do work if they're done correctly. And again, it's down to design. It's not the fact that it's a stable coin. The same thing applies to CBDCs, which I don't necessarily agree with uh, describing them as a type of stable coin. I think uh, I would say the CBDC is effectively using the same technology as a stable coin, but what makes it different from a stable coin is the economic modeling and the governance behind it and the issue and authority at the end of the day. So, but that's uh, another rabbit hole that could take us very far <laughs> at this point. Okay, so Justine, should I look forward to, to uh, CBDC hopefully or should, be, should I be nervous or both? Short version. Um, so, I mean, when it comes to CBDCs, it depends on the design and the approach you're going to take, because it's not one size fits all. What I think that banks and central banks and government should be doing is taking the current economic monetary system, seeing all the flaws and the problems are on the grand uh, macroeconomic scale, and then shifting to CBDCs. Mm. So on this note, I just like to always make a bit of a philosophical sort of backstory to all this central bank, digital coins. Um, Basically, in the 1940s, 1950s, in certain states like US, Chile, Scotland, and many others, we lived in a time where we didn't have central banks. So we had private actors, banks um, in the open free markets dominating the space. And basically, these were reliable payment systems. And this is why um, uh, economics and economies flourished, because they were free from inflation, free from the monopoly of money, free from governments. So why did central banks come into the space? Basically, they, they realized you can leverage borrowing cheap cash to pay off government debt, and that is why we have central banks. So I think if we had to remove the protection that central banks give to commercial banks from deposits and bailouts and et cetera, which is the only reason why people put their money in central banks, we will move back to the free open markets and these could include commercial banks, they could include stablecoin, they could include CBDCs. Um, so all living in some symbiosis, 
but without the control of one player dominating the space in a complete monopoly. So go back to the free open markets and let consumers and users choose. That's what I feel. Philip, should I be scared? Should I be hopeful? Both, um, which is why I said we might, the analogy was an, an analogy. I wasn't saying CBDCs are stable coins. I was saying it, it's, it's a trajectory because each CBDC, as if you look at the pilots, at the trials, at the research that's coming out, each of them are very different. They're built different, they have different intentions. And some of those intentions will be nefarious, some of them will be um, very opaque. Mm -hmm. um, and, but those are the realities at the moment with current fiat systems. So I, I, you know, I don't think it's a matter of a it's going to be the panacea. It's not going to be a currency that's going to fix everything. I think the future will see an existence of you know, fiat as we know it, mm -hmm. and then a collection of uh, stable coins and some CBDCs. But there's always going to be, um, depending where the market is, I mean, the, the global world economy, there's always going to be an arbitrage opportunity to go to maybe the, some of the less uh, you know, regulated CBDCs. Because in the first instance, what we were discussing earlier, you were saying, what's stopping a central bank from freezing the assets in the same way that we've seen with Circle's approach to the tornado cash sanctioning, um, you know, that basically a whole, a whole block can be chucked out of, a, of, of being processed or, or, or assets frozen. So it's both, um, but I do see it that there is some positive and silver lining in short is, is increased liquidity potential, um, mm -hmm. you know, in the, in the global markets. And it's happening in a macroeconomic time where there is already uh, a big battle for which is the dominant fiat. And in parallel, there is this war between private entities chipping away at um, the self-sovereignty mm -hmm. of central banks and, uh, and their ability to kind of continually print money. So you're going to see potentially more, more private stablecoin projects, mm -hmm. more nation states going CBDC live, um, and I think there's going to be a coexistence. Um, I mean, assuming you're passionate about self-sovereignty, I'm going to stick with him for one second. Assuming you're passionate about self-sovereignty, Take your microphone back. I'm going to bang, I'm going to bang you, then go to me. Sure. I mean, what's an example of a CDBC that allows you to be sovereign? What's the best case, what's the best case scenario? I, I think that would be one which doesn't allow any central authority to... Um, this isn't an ideal scenario, right? It doesn't, doesn't allow you know, for you the know, freezing you know, CBDC stands for Central Bank Digital Currency. Yeah. So one that's not centralized? No, not, it can be central, centrally issued, but the, the continuing ongoing monitoring of transactions, maybe, you know, I'm talking about an ideal, I don't necessarily ascribe mm. to that. But I mean, I think that would probably be uh, the utopian freedom maximalist would probably uh, wish for a, a currency that can't be frozen, you know, transactions can't be chucked out for being uh, malicious. But, by the way, I, I'm not necessarily arguing that the government shouldn't have the ability to freeze. Yeah. I'm really pointing that they have the ability to freeze with the central bank digital currency. If you've got an arms transaction or an illegal drug deal or something bad, then you probably want them to be able to freeze in some cases. I can see some people arguing. But personally, I, I agree with that. You know, I think there should be some level of control. I don't think we will ever achieve that ideal of controlless, um, I say, stable coin or, or CBDC. CBDC, no way. You know, there's always going to be an element of control. Interesting. Miko, please. Yeah, I, I, I agree with the others that uh, there's an element of scale. So if we have uh, many little banks and eliminate them and have uh, just uh, one big bank that's a government, it's going to have a much more liquidity there. But there's also other trade-offs what we are doing here. So uh, if you follow the development of the cashless society, like what's happening in the Nordics where you don't have real cash anymore. If you go to a Sweden, if you go to a Finland, you can't pay in a store with the cash. You need you need to pay with the card. Same happens in India. They are running the uh, UPI system that's uh, tied to your identity and always when you're paying, government knows that you're paying. And uh, it, it's, it's a super, super powerful tool. So uh, it gets rid of the bad people. Like if you're not paying your taxes, they can just like uh, freeze your account or taking your money away. And it's already happening in India. It's happening in China. So it, it's super, super efficient uh, tool to uh, keep uh, people in control or uh, have a gov government staying in a power. And uh, we need to ask, like, do we want to have this kind of future? Like, uh, is, there, is there going to be any kind of self-custody or, or uh, self sovereign solid solutions? I don't believe so, because the last 20 years of development with the FATF and all the money laundering policies have been towards the goal to take this away from people. 
So why would governments suddenly turn around now and decide that, hey, yeah, we are, we, we are actually going the wrong direction? There's no science for that. So all the, all the CPTC solutions that are being rolled out, they are based on the fact that the government can decide any day like that you don't deserve your money anymore. It's just like a one button. It, there doesn't need to be a justice. It can be a regulator decide that you are not a good person and uh, you don't have money anymore. And so I think, that, I think that's the future. And show everyone your hat. Yeah, it's a nice hat. No, sh show them your hat. It says privacy. So, yes? I've Paul, please. I think uh, one of the things we need to do here is not conflate self-sovereignty, uh, you know, privacy and, and digital identity and so forth, and all these, these issues that are, you know, apparently under threat by the existence of CBDCs. We have to look, again, it's, I'm repeating the same thing here, but it's, it's about the design. So if a government, uh, for example, doesn't care about the privacy of its citizens and the government doesn't actually want its citizens to have freedom, they will design a CBDC implementation where they have complete control. If a government in a democratic state or pseudo-democratic state, whatever the case may be, uh, this is not a political discussion, uh, decides, okay, we want to make sure pe the people, the citizens have freedom. We want to make sure that there is innovation that's, uh, you know, that's encouraged across the industries. We want to make sure that uh, you know, people have the ability to, to grow their assets and the economy grows as a result, et cetera, et cetera. Then there, is, uh, there are design options that can support and encourage these things. Uh, for example, the more common design options being looked at in Western states for CBDCs is a two-tiered model which somewhat resembles the existing banking model. The central bank issues the M0. The distribution of that cash comes out of an ATM controlled by the commercial banks or otherwise. And in a CBDC distribution model, I mean, no central bank today, maybe except for China, has the capacity or the interest in having to do customer support for every single citizen. Right. They don't want to have to issue a wallet and manage that wallet for every, every single citizen, and they don't want the liability of the personal information of every single citizen. So what they're looking at is a two-tiered model where the existing banks, the existing fintechs, the existing institutions who are licensed and regulated by the bank are responsible for the distribution. And all the central bank is doing here is they're the governing authority and the issuing authority for that currency. But then it comes down to design, and the focus should be on the infrastructure design, because the currency is nothing more than value store issued by an authority that someone trusts. And that same thing applies to crypto, it applies to stable coins, it applies to NFTs, or whatever the case may be. It's a value store of some form. So if we step back and look at this in an abstract manner, then if you design the right infrastructure in the right two-tiered model, you can have the coexistence of stable coins, which could be the evolution of commercial bank money, and cryptocurrencies, and CBDCs, and NFTs, and people can have the ability to, to enable what I, what I call currency fluidity. You pay with what you have because you're exchanging the value, and the person you're paying gets what they want because the infrastructure takes care of the exchange. That is the ideal future, in my opinion. So I, I, I was going to say, say I think, we're, we're out of time. I, he got the last word. I was just going to say, I think he said everything we need to say. Let's go. Oh, <laughs> I'm oh, well, you know what? I second that emotion. Okay, big round of applause, please, for our panel. You, you got the last word. That was very well done. We'll put it together. All right, thank you all. Please.